So uh, welcome everyone to the When Projects Go Wrong, Project Horror Stories uh, webinar by Mail Manager, the Outlook add-in created by Arup to help companies get control of their, of the, of their email. Um, this webinar is really for um, kind of anyone in a project-based role in a project-based business um, who has kind of you know, maybe been in a position in the past where you've kind of been in an uncomfortable position and had to rely on finding an email which maybe you didn't kind of know where where that was and it had a material impact to your firm or you're trying to take a really proactive approach to avoid uh, that kind of thing happening to your business in, in the future. So thank you all for attending. I'm sure you've all been bombarded with lots of webinar invitations and that sort of thing. And we really appreciate the fact you've took time out of your day to attend this one. It's great to see so many of you on as well. We've got over 200 registrations, which is actually a kind of personal record really for the company. So um, thank you, uh, you know, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a really kind of um, uh, heartfelt way. But thanks very much. In terms of introductions for this webinar, we've got um, uh, we've got four uh, four speakers uh, with, uh, with uh, myself obviously being one of them, but we've also got my colleagues uh, Guy Seawin and Lucy Pryor, who are senior client managers at at, at Mail Manager, and Sarah Fox, uh, a, a well-known and regarded contract specialist within the construction industry and author of the 500 Word Contract. Thanks very much for joining us, Sarah. You're welcome. Um, we do, uh, having four speakers in four different locations, um, uh, I'm really hopeful that there's no technical glitches with this. Um, please bear with us if, if there are. Um, I've also got two young children at home, so I'm just hoping they don't kind of try and assault me or each other during the next 45 minutes. So I'm um, going to go on uh, to uh, some, of, um, Sarah's, some of Sarah's content in terms of what, she, what she's go going to share with you. Um, but first of all, just a brief in introduction really for some context of a webinar. Lots of you will know Arup. If you don't, he, you know, here's, here's some background. They've, they've worked on some of the largest, uh, biggest and best projects ac across the world. And you probably, if you've heard of Mail Manager, if you've heard of Arup, you probably haven't heard of Mail Manager. Um, Mail Manager is a solution which Arup created a number of years ago because they identified a problem in their business, which was the level of risk they were exposed to when it came to trying to retrieve emails, which were really important and critical to the project. Um, they decided to try and develop something which they could turn on in any office overnight and would automate the filing process, uh, which is kind of where this, this solution is, has, has come from. The theme for today is horror stories and kind of what happens when a project goes wrong and what becomes re really important. And I'm sure there's lots of you on there who have been in that position before. So uh, that kind of brings me on to my next, uh, uh, the, 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 the star of the show, which is Sarah Fox. So uh, Sarah, uh, um, welcome. Thank you very much. So uh, I kind of come from the point of view as I have done disputes. I've been to the Court of Appeal. Um, we weren't involved in the emails back then, but um, I'm now very much focused on how you set up projects and how you set up contracts to avoid the avoidable disputes. And then if you do have a dispute to make sure that you've got the information you need to hand that you can find when you need it. So one of the things I'm interested in is how we negotiate contracts. What are the most negotiated contracts term? Now the IACCM, which is an international association for con con contract and commercial management, does research and it looks at the terms that are the most negotiated across different sectors. And as you can see, we've got things like the usual suspects, limitation on liability, liquidated damages, responsibilities of the parties, all that kind of stuff nothing there to do with communication systems and yet most disputes are caused by failure to communicate whether that's failure to communicate in the contract what the parties actually want or failure to communicate during a project as to what is actually happening what is changing on site so although these are the most negotiated contract terms we're focusing when we negotiate contracts on actually stuff that doesn't make that much difference they're certainly not any of the causes of disputes so we've got a number of different bits of research that look at what causes disputes. So Arcadis, a big global consultancy, they ask all their internal staff, um, so it's slightly self-selecting, what are the biggest causes of the disputes that have been coming across their desk? And fairly consistently for the first five years, contract administration was a big one. Um, but now we're looking at the um, parties failing to understand their contracts. So they don't really know um, what's in there 
because they can't read it, it's not well written, it's not designed as a project management tool. Contracts are very much designed as a legal enforcement tool. But the second one, errors and omissions in the contract and being able to use it is really important. So um, the thing is, if you can't comply with your contractual obligations, it means you can't give the information to the right parties at the right time that allows you to keep your rights and remedies, that enables you to talk, to communicate, collaborate. There's been a really good example with the pandemic of how contracts don't actually have all the answers to how we should communicate issues. Um, when it first happened, sites were being shut down unilaterally. Nobody was talking to each other. They were all going home. They then weren't having site meetings. They were then riffling through their contracts, trying to find the answer as if the contract ever has the answer. Um, and that was really caused by the fact that we have these dysfunctional contracts that aren't designed to help us manage issues as they arise on contracts, on projects. So contracts have kind of got into a bit of a stalemate. They're not actually working to help communication flowing across a project. So the causes of global construction disputes, though, according to the IACCM, are very different. So instead of having um, uh, limits on liability, that's not a cause. It matters to a dispute, but it doesn't cause it. The things that they were looking at fifth, the fifth most negotiated items, which was price, is actually the first and second causes of disputes. Money, money talks. It's really, really important. But payment processes um, are dysfunctional at best, even though we've had in the UK construction acts in 1996 and 2008, which were trying to help to resolve all these issues to do with payment. It have not actually been that successful. So back in 1983, we had a report which basically said that there was contractual abuse in the contract in the construction industry. And it was looking at the fact that there were persistent imposition of onerous terms. So actually, what all of that means since 1983, not much has changed. Um, and in 2019, the Arcadis report actually had a quote by somebody that said a contract should first and foremost be a document that speaks clearly and fairly to those actually involved on the project on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's my first point. If you really want good communication, good understanding, to avoid disputes, you need to write your contracts clearly. And for the people who are using them, not lawyers writing for lawyers. We don't want contracts that you shove in a drawer. We want contracts that you actually you do flick through to find out what processes you should be using, who you should be communicating with, what format you should be sending that information in, what records you need to keep. The second thing you really need to do is get a second pair of eyes on your contract. Too much in contractual and project management terms is based on individuals, what they know in their heads. Now, if it's in your head, that's fine. But the minute you're off site and everyone else is on site, maybe because of a lockdown, maybe because you're homeschooling, maybe because you've moved jobs, that doesn't actually help the project anymore. So we need to have a contract which works objectively rather than based on the information that is in people's heads. Generally speaking, the other thing that we find is if you have a second pair of eyes, they pick up the inconsistencies, the ambiguities, they pick up the errors and omissions because they can see it with a completely fresh pair of eyes. And the third thing that's really important is to get someone who's impartial to help administer the contract, to help the communication flow between the two parties, because good communication can avoid disputes. Bad communication is just the start of friction which can end up in multi-million pound claims. Uh, but impartial contract administrators do more than just help communication flow. They help manage the changes to the project, manage changes to price, time, cost, quality, all of that. Manage change where we have to implement, for example, site operating procedures, which say that everyone has to be two meters apart. You have to do hand washing. You have to change the way people travel to work. You may even be changing the working hours of a site. So, that contract administrator is also important for dealing with payment, as we've seen a really major cause of disputes and performance, again, a major cause of disputes. Contract administrators should be looking for defects, should be looking for quality issues when they're pricing and paying for work. So that's how we should be setting up contracts. The question is, if we don't set them up properly, how might that affect things? Well, um, most projects, most contracts actually have specific communication channels. They have specific requirements for who you should give notices to. And this was um, a case just back in 2015 where essentially the notice was given but left with a receptionist. So it was taken into a big building in London, left with a the receptionist. They scanned it and sent it to the relevant person. 
but at no point on the envelope did it actually say who the relevant person was. The contract asked them to send it to a specific person. Um, now, it was agreed that this notice had been received. So this is kind of like, it was getting a bit technical around the edges to bring a claim in the first place. But the court were really clear. They wanted the notice to have validity, but they also said they did not want to condone sloppy procedures. Because what they've said is, if the contract asks for X and Y, we don't want Z. We want X and we want Y. We don't want just X. We don't want just Y. We don't want any other letter of the alphabet. We want what the contract says, because that's what the parties expect. They put it in there probably for a reason. So they didn't want to condone sort of just taking a fast and loose approach to what the contract requires people to do when it comes to giving the right person notice in the right sort of format. So, of course, part of the reason we have those formats is to kind of deal with things like security, making sure it goes to the right person at the right time, that we don't have data breaches, that we don't have um, trusted uh, recipients and all that kind of stuff. Now, emails... Uh, got a bit of a bad reputation um, when they first happened because they would end up bouncing, going to the wrong pay place, all that kind of stuff. Lawyers are maybe a little conservative in nature. I don't know about you, but... <laughs> um, so often they deal with what they know, paper. They've been using it for hundreds and hundreds of years. They're happy with it. They understand it. They get it. Emails, maybe received or not, sent to the right person or not, bounced back, gone into some sort of file. They don't know about it. So we're still playing a game of catch up when it comes to law and accepting certain things as contractual. Now, the, 19, the 1677 Statute of Frauds Act is the oldest piece of legislation I ever refer to and it's to do with guarantees. And essentially um, what was happening was uh, an international contract between two companies was being guaranteed by another company. Effectively, one of the parties to the contract was a kind of like um, a, a party of convenience in order to put money through this contract is it always easier to name a company we'll call them company a even though they weren't the person who was really responsible so what they said was they set up a series of emails and they said things like please confirm that this is agreed subject to final terms and the final email said many thanks we are all done so they're looking at whether or not that include, concluded a contract between the parties. Now, it's very easy to use kind of fairly loose and informal terminology in an email without thinking about it in any great detail. But the initial email had referred to the fact that this transaction would be guaranteed by a particular company. Now, this isn't just a question of niceties. This was for $54 million at stake on a series of emails. And it was clear that actually, in some respects, the email chain hadn't worked very well because they couldn't see the original emails, it, the chain had broken. So they weren't entirely piecing together the agreement in a, in a coherent manner. So really important that you understand how to use email chains, how to use um, all that kind of stuff to create an auditable contract chain. Because when there's 54 million quid at stake, having it nice and neat makes it much easier um, to bring a claim or to defend a claim if you've got all that information in the right sort of place. Um, so that's a first horror story, 54 million quid over a couple of emails, a bit tricky. Um, but when it comes to claims, um, Max Abrahamson, who wrote a book about the ICE conditions of contract, said that basically speaking, if you get to a football dispute, whether that's in court, adjudication, arbitration or mediation, the one thing that you will wish you had done at the start of the project is get your records in order. It is much, much, much harder to sort out records at the end to find the information you need. And I know this is something that you're really interested in, but I remember many years ago when I first started as a lawyer doing a dispute where we had to hire rooms and we were delivered a literally boxes and boxes and boxes of faxes, which in those days were pale pieces of shiny paper which had all curled up and were fading rapidly we had to try and go through these boxes and boxes and boxes of documents to try and find the information now if you don't have good records sometimes that absolutely your claim will be thrown out so there was a case um, under fiddick um, in the falkland islands where they were meant to keep under the terms of the fiddick contract contemporaneous records of expenses being incurred so there was no doubt that they would have been entitled to this money had they kept the records. 
The problem was, well, they couldn't actually find all their records of the costs they'd incurred. And the contractor said, well, that's, it's all right. I, as a witness, can give you that evidence, oral testimony, I can stand in a witness box or I can write it into a statement. And the court said, that's not good enough. That's not contemporaneous. It wasn't actually created at the time you were incurring those costs. It's created two, three, four, or even seven years later. So that doesn't have the same value as something that you created at the time. So they actually lost their case because they couldn't find the records or they hadn't created the records that the contract asked them to do. So records will always, always be the number one thing that will help you to win or might cause you to lose a claim. But the problem with records is we can sometimes end up with way too many records. So Wembley Stadium was built massively over budget, massively over time. Um, the English National Football Stadium, which was a um, government funded body set up specifically for this, did a deal with the main contractor who was Multiplex. Multiplex in turn sued lots and lots of their subcontractors. We've got lots and lots of litigation. And as part of the litigation with their uh, steel subcontractor, just a single part of that litigation, the legal costs incurred were over 45 million pounds. And one million pounds was spent just on photocopying. Now, I imagine a lot of that was email chains that hadn't been shortened. So uh, an email chain could go on for pages and pages and pages, but because they hadn't, they were all individual documents and they had to be um, photocopied and the whole round. Also, there was duplication. There were chains, webs of information going around that hadn't been collated properly. And actually collating information from the beginning of a project in a way that would help you represent your position at the end is really, really important. And in fact, because of COVID-19, we found that um, we're going to moving to virtual hearings. And there was a bit of advice from one of the judges recently on a virtual hearing. So this is fresh off the press, just came out recently. And what the judge said was, if we're going to have hearings virtually, then you're not going to be able to send me 30 lever arch files of paperwork. I can't deal with that in my home office or my home courtroom. What I need is proper bundles, searchable bundles, that are just the essential things. And actually what they, he also said was, what we really want is for you to engage advisors from the beginning of the project to help you build the information you need for a specific um, case or for your position for the end. So actually you should have in mind, what are you gonna use this document for the minute you create it? So you have to think about the fact that although you think you're only conversing Jacob to um, Lucy, actually somebody else might read it and if they the right honorable or his honor judge then that's going to actually have a slightly different feeling and we've got some examples of emails that actually went before the court now the first one was in a claim for 160 million pounds so a lot of money at stake and this was one of the emails that was exhibited as part of the court record um, so this was a case back in 2015 claim for 160 million quid and they had to, he had to try and argue as to what this email meant. And he was trying to say that rather than getting them out, as in getting them off the project, what he meant was helping them to get out of the failure that they were in. Mm, it was, it, he said it was a bit of a joke to a friend. Well, I'll tell you what, jokes to friends should be on the telephone and not recorded by email, okay? Do not joke. Judges don't seem to have the same sense of humour that you might have. But the judge basically was allowed to interpret what he thought this email meant. He wasn't actually that interested what Mr Healy meant or what Mr Pate thought it meant. He was allowed to decide what he thought this meant. Now, Mr Healy, when he wrote it, probably wasn't thinking that a judge was going to look at it. But a judge did look at it and he did interpret it and it didn't go down well. Now, the second one, there, to be fair, I have chosen the the maybe uh, slightly on the edge, but actually there's much worse emails going around that are exhibited to court proceedings. I always say that if when you're in court and your mum or your gran was actually listening and they read out an email from you, from Jacob or from Guy or from Lucy, and it had your name on it and it had swear words on, and you'd feel slightly concerned about your mum or your gran or your aunt listening to that, that's the attitude you should take to all the communications you have during a project. So this talks about the fact the crisis on, on us and what they actually said was the functionality is a poor fit. This is an admission of liability.
this was a claim for 100 million pounds worth of failed software it's really really important that internal communications about whether or not they think they're in breach of contract are dealt with from the point of view that if somebody else reads it it will absolutely catastrophically hit their case but also that this sort of language is not going to endear you to a judge i don't like to tell you this but they're quite straight laced they will have seen it all before they're not you know they're, they're not hermits but it won't necessarily get you get them on your side and that's the best you can hope for is that when you write emails on a project you look objective you look fair and you look professional and those are really important things to bear in mind because in the heat of the moment it's kind of easy to bang off a bit of an informal email to a mate only to find that it comes back to haunt you later as a horror story so these are my um, examples of how you can use and abuse emails to help or to hinder your case Thanks very much, Sarah. I think um, the kind of overwhelming, overwhelming thing which comes from there is for everyone and all of us really to kind of think about A, the role email plays in terms of evidence on a project, but also to really think about how we use it and if we would be happy for, uh, you know, a, a kind of third party to uh, read what we've, what we've written. Um, so um, I'll, uh, we'll um, move on to uh, uh, my colleague Guy, Guy Seward. So hello, Guy. Hello, Jacob. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. I'm going to be a lot more careful about what I put in my emails going forward, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, my name's Guy. I'm a senior client manager here. I'm going to be taking you through, running you through a few instances of real life occasions where emails have... Okay, I do apologise. A book has just appeared in a green plume of smoke on my desk and it says real life horror stories to do with emails. I should probably read it. I'm not, I'm not scared. <laughs> Story number one, silence of the emails. Kieran was responsible for a large project team and had a disagreement with a customer. This stemmed from communication that had happened before he was ever involved in the project at all. He knew there was a simple email that would solve everything. He searched through his own outlook, nothing. He broke into his colleagues' inboxes, nothing. He scoured the server, still nothing. The disgruntled customer wouldn't back down. The business had to pay 60,000 US dollars. But what's worse than a financial penalty? A tarnished reputation. Kieran was embarrassed. Ooh, I'm shocked and horrified by just how scary that actually was. Um, $60,000 gone missing. Uh, Kieran's reputation smeared, all due to a, a simple email. Imagine knowing that that email existed. Frustration. I can almost guarantee the next story is going to be far more pleasant. Let's have a look. Story number two. It, or IT. Lily owned a 30-person architecture firm which had gone through a period of high staff turnover. As director, she was left struggling to recover agreements made by her staff in emails as they were locked in people's inboxes. Emails weren't in a shared location, so when people jumped ship and left the company, correspondence was lost. With projects ongoing, new team members joining, new stresses stressing, it was impossible to keep up with deadlines and avoid costly rework. Deadline after deadline was missed. Incorrect work was delivered. Lily lost business. As if that wasn't enough, they lacked an email audit trail required to pass their ISO accreditation. Ooh, I can only apologize <laughs> for, for leading you into a full sense of security. That was a lot more terrifying than, than, than I let on. Losing clients, not, not achieving ISO, all because it's difficult to start to get staff working consistently. It's exasperating. Courage, friends. Third time lucky. This story will be a walk in the park. Story number three, the Texas email chain massacre. Stephen was asked by a client to see all the information relating to one project. He was with a large engineering firm and often worked with a variety of parties along the supply chain. When this particular request came in, his team were on holiday, so it was impossible for him to get a complete view of the conversations that had taken place. 
Stephen had to explain, he, he wasn't able to, ac to access the info they needed, which made him lose face. He spent two weeks redoing work that had already been done. On more than one occasion, the same piece of work was completed again and again and again, three times, wasting valuable resources and effort. Well, poor, poor Stephen. Redoing drawings, reports over and over in an industry where, where, where billable hours exist. To have that time wasted, infuriating. All right, I think I'm, I'm done reading stories and I'm gonna put this book away now and hope it disappears. That, that's all from me. And I, I really hope my colleague Lucy has some answers because I'm stressed. Thanks, Guy. <laughs> I, li I like the stories. <laughs> um, Jacob, would you like to just let me share my screen quick? Yes, of course. So if I'll, I'll just press stop sharing. Then uh, if you press start sharing, that should, uh, that should appear any minute. Thank you very much. I uh, hope that's helpful for everyone, by the way. Obviously, it's you know, designed to be slightly lighthearted and, to and tongue in cheek. Um, I think, uh, you know, naturally, um, so, uh, it uh, hopefully links nicely to what, um, to, to what Sarah's outlined. So, uh, I was just going to say, before Lucy started, although they sound like horror stories made up, I can tell you that I've come across every single one of those when looking at disputes, looking at contract formation, items lost, things just unable to be found, evidence that doesn't really help your case and just disastrous um, relationships between com parties as a result of it. So yeah, it might seem like a horror story, but it actually happens. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again, Guy. There's lots of serious stuff out there at, at the moment. So thanks very much for that. Just um, a bit of housekeeping, which I forgot. There is a Q&A feature. So if you have any questions at all, then uh, there's a Q&A feature within Zoom. So if you've got any questions for any of us or Sarah, just put, put them in there and we'll answer them at the end. So uh, yeah, t t take it away, Lucy. Thanks, Jacob. Um, yeah, so so Guy's obviously given us a couple of examples, real life examples of, of where things have, have gone wrong. Um, and on the screen, here are, are typically some of the key issues that directors and project leaders tell me every day um, that they have around email um, and one of the the ones that always comes up is the risk you know risk of losing sensitive information which I suppose relates to the fees contractual agreements which are being sent and received in email and they're just sat in someone's inbox and it becomes a real challenge when these disputes start to arise is all the information you need um, it is scattered all over the place um, so I suppose what should look quite familiar is is what you're seeing on the screen there um, and lots of companies I speak to have a process in place which staff should adhere to but most of them tell me that 80 percent of their staff just do their own thing um, now where Mail Manager fits in, which is a solution that Arup Engineering have developed to make sure they control all their emails and uh, give their staff the ability to find any email within a few clicks, it, it really does bridge the gap between everyone's personal inboxes and where you as a business want to store and centralize all your project information, which could be on a traditional file server or it could be on common data environments like SharePoint. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you into the system. We won't spend too long on it, but I hope to give you a, a good example of, of how other companies across the AEC are, are using the system. Okay, so I'm in Outlook here. First things first, what actually is Mail Manager? Now, Mail Manager is a simple Outlook plugin, and it sits in the ribbon of Outlook up the top here. Now, typically... Uh, as I said, most companies have a process which normally is dragging and dropping emails into project folders. But realistically, do most people do it? The answer is probably no. So we needed a system which would almost form part of our workflow with an Outlook. So there's a few different ways to file. Say I've come in the office, I have a read of an email. Now this one in particular relates to a contract adjustment. Now for this example, I'm not going to reply to it. What most people will do now is they'll close the email down and again, it stays in their inbox and no one else can see it. If I close an email down with Mail Manager, the first thing I'm going to get is a prompt. And this has been a game changer for us. We're reminding people to file and creating that habit there. It also predicts the project folder that you need to file into. 
using artificial intelligence and machine learning. At one click of a button, that email is now stored against the project folder, whether that's on the server or in SharePoint, so that you know that if you ever need to find it, it's in the project folder. Now, another key thing that comes up often when I'm speaking to project leaders and directors is, well, some of our team are quite good at filing the incoming emails, but most of them will say, we don't go into sent items. And actually, sometimes, you know, back to Sarah's examples, they're even more important because it's what you're agreeing to. So we wanted to find a way to really capture that. Now this email here, have you received the cost evaluation for the Fitzroy Street project? I'm going to reply to that. Yes, Alex, please proceed. Now that seems like such a simple email, but that could save my, uh, I won't say the words, in a few years time. So if I hit send now, Again, I'm going to get this prompt that comes up. I've got this habit. I actually want to use this system. It's so simple. It's telling me where to put it. But what it's going to do this time is it's going to file the email I've received and my reply all in one click. So most importantly, I have that full audit trail. So in short, filing's designed to form part of your workflow. People won't forget to file and you're not reliant on them remembering to do it, but you're filing within one click to have the assurance that it's all against the project. Now, what I'm gonna do is take you onto the second part of the system, which end users love with Mail Manager, which is the search. So the search sits up the top here. If you click this button, you'll be brought to a screen like so. So it's just a pop-up out of Outlook. Now in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see I've got over 300,000 emails. Of course, I'm uh, not, not that busy. I'm not involved in all of those. Uh, they're across multiple projects, but it's mirroring the permissions to uh, the folders sat in SharePoint and the file server. So let's go for one example. Um, Jacob, uh, Jacob sent an email to a client a couple of years ago, which related to the cladding for a building. Now, I'm not involved in this email. A couple of weeks later, I've got John on the phone. He's going mad about something. I need to find this email. It's all gone wrong on the project. And Jacob's, uh, Jacob's left or he's on holiday, whatever. Key example of how Mail Manager would work for that. In Enter Search Terms up the top, you can search for any keyword or phrase within the email. So I'm going to pop in the word cladding. On the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see it's already down to 300 emails. Now on the left in the from to the to, I'm going to say from Jacob to John. And there's my email. So no more scurrying around trying to find emails, trying to get to clients, you know, as quick as possible and spending days. You've got it here in two clicks. And I'll go through one final example. So uh, we speak a lot about contracts attached to emails and, and having them together with the, with the email. Now, we had an issue on a project uh, about a year ago and uh, an email was sent to a client which had a contract attached to it and we needed it couldn't remember what project it relates to it happens we're not uh, we're, we're not amazing all the time with the memory so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say well I'm looking for an email which was sent or received in the last year so you've got a date range bar there I'm going to say that it was from my colleague Alex I'm going to mark that it contained an attachment and we can even put in the attachment oh was it over a year ago Love, a, love an online uh, screen share <laughs> to put this project in. There we go. So I sent it actually. Um, so I've got the email very quickly. I can double click it or you can right hand click and it will pull it straight into Outlook for you. So you can now work on that email, forward it or respond to it. So key thing with the search is you've got one place to search across the whole company on any project regardless as to whether you're involved. So if you have any claims, litigation issues, any email needs you need to find, you've got it and you'll be litigation ready rather than reactive. So Jacob, I'm going to hand back over to you. Thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, so just going to press share on my screen. So uh, let me just, should all be able to see my seat you should all be able to see my screen. So in summary, um, really mail managers designed for businesses out there who have typically got more than one person involved in a project or exchanging information which might become important in the future 
and probably looking around the business know who's really good at maintaining an audit trail on a project and probably knows who isn't so from our point of view we wanted to achieve total consistency across the company and really a kind of mail managers almost forget out of jail kind of sleep at night option because we know that if there is a project or an issue in the future we're going to have that information to hand and i'm guessing from uh, you know from a D, from at least some of the people who, who have attended this webinar you've probably all had that short intake of breath you feel when you're asked to retrieve an email or when you're trying to remember where it is or, or who you sent it to etc particularly even more important at the moment yeah if um, you know if somebody's left the company um, in terms of uh, kind of actions from from today i think there's two really which we'd recommend one is to naturally have a really good look at um, your contracts i think there's lots of businesses who probably feel a little bit exposed by them at the moment and now represents a really good opportunity to come out of this crisis with something better in terms of it for, from a contracts point of view so we'll be sharing sarah's sarah's details and you'll be able to look her up on linkedin so it's sarah fox uh, on on linkedin uh, and really recommend kind of getting in touch with her for any 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 contracts advice if what you've seen today looks like something which could be applicable for your company naturally given what's going on at the moment we're not expecting any businesses to kind of wake up one morning and implement an email management solution overnight but if now represents an opportunity to evaluate your business process and identify some ways of of kind of improving how you work then we'd love to sh uh, spend a bit more time with you for a half an hour screen share to show you how the solution would work would work for you which um which will kind of be in touch with you to um, get your feedback on on, on that um, before we close off really just like to open the floor for any any questions really i can see a couple of i can see a couple have come in so i'm just going to read them out uh so i've got uh one question which has come in on uh, seeing that does mail manager work or work on mobile email uh so yes it does there's a number of uh, kind of options a number of ways to uh to file emails on the move depending on your setup but obviously you know all of our clients have teams on site have directors or anyone really you know who's spending time out of the office needs needs to be able to file the information um, and then we've had another question come in which uh, kind of said how is mail manager different or better than what we already already use um, naturally i'm pretty biased i'd say mail manager is you know the, the one of the wonders of the world and the absolute best thing since sliced bread all I can really share is why businesses partner with us and that's because software is really really easy to use and cost effective to implement by that I mean you know you can be set up in kind of in a couple of hours I mean how many things can you realistically kind of um, implement in that in that time and then the other thing is just how intuitive it is we've all used systems in the past where we've had to chase people and ask people to use something and this definitely isn't that this is something which makes filing a habit and stuff 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 love genuinely love to love to use it um, uh, another question which has come in uh, regarding is mail manager licensed uh, per user or per machine so it's licensed typically per user just based on concurrent usage so that means you can have a number of um, you can have one person using mail manager across a number of devices which we think is just reflective of how people how people work um, Another, another, another person's. Uh, there's another, another question come in saying an advantage of a paper-based system or PDF format is that confidence can be had and that it can always be read. Read can the same. Uh, I have, can't read. Uh, can the same confidence be had in MSG files? And will Outlook always support the file type? Um, really good question. I suppose it's kind of a. Um, almost like a microsoft based point really in terms of how long will things like teams and mail and email be around and probably the answer to that is you know for a, for an awful awful long long time so um i agree there is a kind of an advantage and a, and a certain amount of comfort from a paper-based system but i think the bit which makes people uncomfortable is how consistently people are going to follow that and if they don't if we only get half a story then kind of how much comfort can we really really gain from it so um i think it, uh, it's difficult to say kind of whether pdfs will always be supported forever but the answer is kind of the, um the pretty confident that emails going go, going nowhere um jacob i would say that actually paper-based systems aren't that easy to find because um certainly when um yeah. the way they're printed the way they're stored the way they're archived 
we've seen um, paper that has been lifted off, the printing has been lifted off when it's been put in plastic wallets. We've seen paper disintegrate, eaten, burnt, flooded out. So yes, paper, um, you can always read it, but only if you can find it, you can interpret it and it's still in a decent um, condition. And actually archiving documents um, for 12 years, which can be as long as a limitation period, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to find it because a lot of these become needles and haystacks. Um, so yes, um, maybe formatting wise, but actually there's an awful lot of risk involved with just storing large quantities of paper for any length of time in order to be able to find it and read it again. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Certainly much better coming c coming from you. Um, uh, but yeah, just to kind of echo uh, Sarah's thoughts, an audit trail generally represents the audit trail of the project. And probably if you look at inboxes around your company, the why exists in someone's inbox. And what I mean by that is like, why have we taken that decision? Why has that person carried out that action? Why have we given this advice? It's really difficult to get that without having access to, to the emails. And everyone has thousands of emails in, the, in their inbox. Um, another question which has come in, um, insightful webinar, uh, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, does Mail Manager back up to the cloud? Uh, yeah, the important thing here is that Mail Manager fits in with your business. So all of you will use Teams, common data environments, a server, maybe SharePoint, and Mail Manager is an add-in which adds in to your business and would effectively um, support the existing kind of permissions and backup routines which you already have. So the level of change is really minimal compared to um, compared to other things which you may have experienced in the past. Um, another question, uh, which is, what do we look at in terms of in, ter in terms of cost? Um, so um, on, on that one, it really does vary based on the size of business. It can be anywhere typically from kind of four pounds up to 14 pounds a user a, user a month, um, but it really does vary based on the size of business. I think from here, if, if this looks like something which could be relevant for your business, maybe not even now, but could be relevant at some point in the future, it's probably worthwhile spending half an hour uh, understanding how it exactly fits and compares to what you do at the moment. Uh, and then most businesses trial mail manager across a couple of people on a, on a project to understand, are people going to use it and where's the return? And that return is typically in time savings, but also in claims and disagreements. And you only ever need to be in one claim or get one invoice paid quicker for something like this to pay for itself. Um, I can see a couple of other questions have come in. I'm very keen not to ignore anyone. So I can see there's another question which has come in on how does Mail Manager address duplication? Um, really, really good question. Um, Mail Manager effectively deduplicates emails, meaning that you only ever get one copy of an email, one copy of an attachment. Um, do all users have to have the same email platform? Another question's come in on email platforms, so Firefox versus Outlook. Yeah, so a really important point. This is an Outlook add-in, so anyone looking to use the Mail Manager on desktop would have to be using Outlook. So if you if you had other things like Firefox or Thunderbird or you know all, all sorts of those kind of um, kind of things, uh, they they wouldn't work. Um, okay, well I think that's all the all the all the questions. Um, Oh, there's a, no, there's not, not one more. Well, again, thank you very much, um, all of you, for, for your time. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Really appreciate your, your insights. And we'll share your details with everyone after the, after the webinar. And uh, Guy, Lucy, thanks, thanks, thanks again. Particularly Guy, absolutely great, great effort there. So uh, nice to have something lighthearted during this time. So thank you all for attending. Look forward to keep getting in touch with you and learning more about how we may uh, be able to help you in the future. Thanks very much.